Good morning. Welcome home. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's stand. And let's bow our hearts to the Lord. So we can open in prayer. Invite the Lord to do whatever he desires. Father, we thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord. It's an honor to come and be in your presence, Lord God. It's an honor to be with your people, Lord. It's an honor, Lord, to worship and praise you and give you thanks, Lord God. We ask this morning that our hearts would be grateful to you, Lord God. For no matter what's going on in our world, God, you sit on the throne. You're in control of all things, Lord God. We pray, Lord, this morning you would help us to make you our focus, Lord. You'd be the center of the service, Lord God. We pray, Lord, for our time of worship and adoration, Lord. Make it a time of intimacy between you and us, Lord God. And then we pray for the time of the Word of God, Lord, that you would teach us, give us understanding and knowledge of the Holy One. Father, it's your heart to bless your people. So, Father, bless us, Lord God. And God, may you be blessed by your people. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. I think it was David that said, I was glad when they said, let's go to the house of the Lord. Good to be here, isn't it?
race that leads the sinner home from death to life
so much to be thankful for, Lord, and grateful for, Lord, Except especially for Jesus, Lord, the life that he's given us, Lord God, and the Holy Spirit that lives in us. And Father, we want you to speak to our hearts this morning, Lord. We want you to work in our hearts, Lord. And we know that you do that through the word of God. So we pray that you'd give us an attentive heart, Lord, Give us an understanding heart, Lord God. And Father, produce in us wisdom today, Lord. Bless your word by your Holy Spirit, Father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> We're glad you're here this morning. Good news. According to the news, his channel, in the last three weeks, the coronavirus has gone down 45%. Well, that's good news. Isn't it? I think it is. And it has nothing to do with inoculations, they say. All of a sudden, it just dropped 45%. I think it's great. So I'm the only one I think that's good news, I guess, but <clears throat> if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Revelations, the last chapter in the Bible, chapter 22. If you need a Bible this morning, because you're going to need one, raise your hand, we'll give you one. Everyone has one? Okay. Uh, we need two over here, Jimmy. Two. Two for the price of one. Revelations chapter 22, the very last chapter in the Bible. Verse 1 says this. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was a tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were from the healing of the nations. <clears throat> and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. There shall be no night there. They need no lamp, nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light and they shall reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. Now I, John, saw the, and heard these things. And when I heard and I saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel 
who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant and of the brethren of the prophets and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal these words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. <clears throat> he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gate into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I'm the root of and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride says, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He who testifies in these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Okay, let's end, our, end the service and pray. You all understood it. <clears throat> I want to read a scripture to you. <clears throat> this is the very beginning of the book of Revelations, and it says this, Blessed, he who, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. I read that to remind you that the book of Revelations and any kind of prophecy is a blessing from God. It's never in any way to put fear in our hearts. So let's backtrack just a moment because <clears throat> this is the sixth of the seventh teaching on the return of Jesus and the end times. We first of all saw the rapture, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And every one of you in this body should know what the rapture of the church is because it's the next prophetic thing that God said is going to happen. There is nothing that needs to happen for it to happen. Let me share just a second with you. The Bible says that literally Christ will come down in the middle of the air and those who are dead in Christ will raise their bodies their spiritual meat, their bodies in the air. Then those who remain, those who are Christians, born again believers, the Bible says will be taken up and all will be go to heaven for a seven year period. The next thing that's to happen prophetically right after the rapture of the church is the great tribulation. <clears throat> For seven years, the Bible talks about it, and we went through this. These are all things I'm just kind of refreshing you on. For seven years, God's wrath will happen upon this earth. There'll be everything that you can think of that will happen. About a little over half of the population of the world will be destroyed that time. And after that seven years, the Bible teaches, and we talked about it, Jesus Christ will return. The second return of Christ, the real return. And when Jesus puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, it'll split in the book of Zechariah, it says. And the Bible says the saints will come with him. That'll be all of us. And all the ones before us will come with him. 
The Bible teaches that then <clears throat> there will be a thousand year reign. For 1,000 years, Jesus Christ will reign in Jerusalem and the saints, the Christians, will rule and reign with him. What a wonderful time that will be. The things you see in our earth going on right now, all the confusion, all the evil, all that is going on will be done away with. Christ will rule and reign. I can't wait for the day. It seems like evil is abounding and winning, but it doesn't win, the Bible says. It can't. For the King of kings and the Lord of lords will come and rule and reign for 1,000 years. After the th thousand year reign, there'll be a great white judgment, the Bible teaches, that every person ever born, not the believers, not the Christians, but everyone else, they'll be raised from the dead and they'll be judged. And the Bible says, Satan will be cast in the lake of fire and so will death and so will those who reject Christ. <clears throat> Then we'll see, that, as we did last week, a new Jerusalem and a new earth. The book of Peter speaks about this is all going to be burned with fire. Everything you see today, everything you see in the universe and the stars and all those things, the Bible says God is going to destroy them and we're going to have brand new. I think that everything has been tainted by sin. And this is one of the reasons why God's going to give us a brand new heaven and a brand new earth, a new city which is called Jerusalem. Now, <clears throat> why does God give us prophecy and why does God want us to know about the future? I believe there are many reasons, but I believe there's just a few I want to share. God doesn't want us to be ignorant. If I knew something concerning that would help my children to know, or my grandchildren, or people that I love and I'm concerned about, I would want them to know it without a doubt. And God doesn't want us to be ignorant concerning these truths. Second of all, God wants you to know that he's in control of all things. Again, God is in control of what's happening right now. I like to say, and, and I'll steal it from somebody else, because it's not my, from me originally, things are not falling apart. Things are falling into place. That's what's happening. Another thing is <clears throat> God's purpose and plan for the future that he has for you and for me and for mankind is happening. In this chapter of Revelation, it is mainly going to be about the new Jerusalem, the new city, the new place that we will live in, and the new place called, really, heaven. According to Jesus describing the size of it, it will be three billion square miles. It's going to be a large city. Many believe that it will be populated by about Three billion people. I don't know how many people have been born, <clears throat> but the percentage of those who will be in heaven forever and ever is very small and minute. This morning you may say, well, I've read articles concerning how many Christians are in America. And there must be a lot of people going to church, so those all must be Christians. The percentage of Christians in America <clears throat> is probably around 2 to 7 percent real Christians. So if we go through history, they figure there's going to be about 3 billion people in heaven. That's kind of scary, Pastor. It shouldn't be. God has given us the way to heaven, and there's only one way, Jesus. God has sent his son to die for the sins of the world, and that includes your sins. And the Bible teaches, as we have read in the book of Revelation, there is a book of life, and when you accept Christ and you're born again, your name is written in the book of life, you belong to God, period. 
I'm 100% assured of my salvation. I don't question whether am I going to heaven. I hope I get to get there. And I hope when I wake up and when I die that I'm in the heaven. Oh, I made it. Woohoo! If I think that, that way, I'm in trouble. That is never what God wants you to think. But let me say this. My life will reflect me being a Christian. In other words, I've been born again. A whole new nature lives in me. And that new nature is going to come out of my life. It's not, I'm not going to be the same person that I was before. I can't be. So we want to look at heaven again. And Jesus is going to emphasize <clears throat> the reality of this is really going to happen. And it's going to be a different picture than what you may think. When I was a kid, I remember watching cartoons. <laughs> and that's when cartoons were clean. That's when cartoons were good. But these cartoons, remember, were the ones that, remember the cat died, and he was up there in heaven, and he's playing the harp. Remember that? How many saw that cartoon? Raise your hand. A few of you. Um, you're aging yourself. And we thought that heaven was like that, and there was a cloud, it's clouds in heaven, and you're on a cloud, and that's not how heaven's going to be like at all, beloved. This will describe it a lot more, and you'll get a lot more understanding. Let's start on verse 1. It says, And he showed me pure rivers of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So in heaven, the Bible teaches there's going to be this river of water. And throughout the Old Testament prophets used the picture of a river as a powerful expression of two things. Prosperity and pleasure. In the book of Psalms, the same scripture, similar, is spoken here. Let me read to you. It's in Psalms 46, 4 and 5. It says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her, just as the break of dawn. So we see a river here to let us know that in heaven, there shall be no want of anything that can make the saint happy. Now listen, think about this this morning. If God was to say to you this morning, what is it that you would ask of me that would make you happy today? You see, God loves you, and God wants you to not be happy because happy is everything that comes from the exterior. So you might be happy this morning because you got a brand new car. Or you might be happy this morning because afterwards you're going out and having lunch at your favorite restaurant. You might be happy because, and you fill in the blank. But if God was to say to you this morning, what do you think or what would you ask of me that would make your life prosperous, Fool, satisfying, what would you ask? God says, it is me that is the only one that can make your life full and have purpose and have meaning. It is me and it is me only, God says. You see, God made you and created you to have that deep relationship with him. That's why he created you. And when a man fulfills, or a woman fulfills what they've been created to do, then what happens is they become, or their life becomes full and has purpose and meaning. Outside of it, it doesn't. Now man searches to fulfill that emptiness and he tries to fulfill it in every single thing you can think of. Some try to fulfill it with alcohol or drugs or pornography. 
all different kinds of things, but it all leads to the same thing, emptiness. A dissatisfied heart and a dissatisfied life. But in heaven, though, God promises you that your life is going to lack nothing and your heart is going to lack nothing. It says here that it proceeds from the throne of God, this river. In other words, it comes from God and its perfect state, and there's nothing that can def be defiled concerning it. Now, in verse 2, it says, In the middle of the street, and on each side of the river, it was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruit, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. So we see a tree of life there, and it spreads out through the whole river, and the Bible teaches about a tree of life in Genesis chapter 3. And here we see a tree of life again. The phrase tree of life is found seven times in the Bible. When God created the Garden of Eden, the tree of life was planted there. How many remember the story? Raise your hand. When Adam and Adam had sinned, God not only kicked man out of Eden, but he kept man from having access to the tree of life. I want to read to you, it's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22 through 24, and it says this, And now lest he put out his hand and take also the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed the cherub at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So we see in this story, and how many remember this story? Raise your hand if you do. Now, what do you think about God kicking them out of the garden of Eden? Some of you don't know what to think. Why would God deny this goodness to them? Kicking them out of a place, really, a heaven, so to say. And why would God do something like that? I thought he loved them. I thought he was the creator of them. I thought he really cared about them. I thought, I thought, I thought. But really, God doesn't think like we think. I want you just for a second to put yourself in the place of Adam. And if you're married, Eve, sit right beside your husband. And all of a sudden you say, God says you don't eat this fruit. And all of a sudden you eat the fruit, you find yourself naked, you're hiding. And everything's changed. Everything has changed. You no longer have that same relationship with God. And now you have this sinful nature. Your mind begins to get polluted. You begin to think differently. You begin to act differently. You have attitudes. All kinds of things begin to happen in you. Now your thought may be this. Well, I just think that God should give me eternal life like this. He should, he should let me eat that fruit and I'll live forever. Now think about this. How many of you would want to live in this old nature just the way you are for the rest of eternity? Raise your hand if you do, and please... Uh, <laughs> I feel bad for you if you do. So God, in his counsel, and his wisdom, he said, you know what? This is what's going to happen. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to let you live in eternity forever and ever and ever, just like you are. With that foul mind that you have, that sinful nature, that self-centeredness, that spiritual laziness, and it goes on and on and on, I'm not going to let that happen to you. I'm going to wait, and I'm going to send my son to redeem you and wash you where you won't have that same thing. You can go into my presence perfectly. Now, without a doubt, God knows what he's doing, doesn't he? And at the time, I'm sure that Adam and Eve probably thought, I just don't understand God. Why doesn't he let me do this? Why is he doing this to me? Ever been there? Ever questioned God about what God is doing? 
Why did you let that happen, God? Everything God does is perfect. Everything. So we see that God works in the sense of not letting Adam be kept for eternity forever and ever like he would be in the sinful nature. Now, there are some people who wonder if we'll eat in heaven. Raise your hand if you like to eat. <laughs> it's funny, as you get older, it seems like you like to eat more. I always have my cracker bench. bench. At night, sometimes I, I fight it, and I say, I'm not going to eat no crackers today. I like saltines with cheese on them, or tuna. And you know what happens to those saltines? They go right to the midsection. And I don't need it. But I sure like to eat them. And there are times I really like to have Chinese food, and I like Mexican food, and I like Italian food, and I like uh, seas candy. I like seas candy. And so I don't think I'd be really happy in heaven if we couldn't eat as happy as I want to be. So I believe, and the Bible does teach, that there is going to be eating in heaven, but we won't need to eat. You know what I really like about it, in eating in heaven? You can eat as much as you want, and you don't get fat. <laughs> so when you get your perfect bodies, they're going to be shh. And men are going to be shh. In verse 3 it says, And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Well, the Bible teaches that there will be no more curse. In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, it speaks about God cursing the earth after man sinned against God. When I was picking some stuff up in the prayer room this morning, I went down to reach and I found a star thistle and it went right into my finger. And I thought to myself, that curse is going to be gone one day. All the things that you see in our world today that are cursed, the Bible says there's not going to be any more in heaven. There'll be no thorns, there'll be no thistles, no foxtails, and you know what's going to be really wonderful? <laughs> There'll be no hay fever. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm sure in the last couple of months had problems with hay fever. There'll be none. I take this medicine. I take eye drops. And it helps, without a doubt. But I'd rather not have it at all. And God says he's going to remove the curse completely. But it says here, but the throne of God and the Lamb of God shall be in it. And he shall serve him. So let me say this to you. There are three things that the Bible teaches that we will do in heaven. What do you think they are? Just think about it for a second. First of all, we're going to do a lot of singing, the Bible teaches. Throughout the book of Revelation... Singing is mentioned many times. Imagine what it's going to be like with three billion voices singing together. Imagine having a perfect voice that does not get off key. Some people, God gifts with voices. And they sound so beautiful and they're so wonderful to worship with their gift. But some can't even keep a tune. And I'm not mentioning any names that I know. But imagine having a perfect voice because we'll have perfect hearts that will come forth with those voices and we'll do a lot of singing. 
Start singing now. Enjoy your singing. Because when we get to heaven, we're going to do a lot of it. In heaven, we will do the second thing, and we will serve. The idea of servanthood runs throughout the book of Revelations. Again, let me share a few scriptures. I'm not going to tell you or read them to you, just where they are. Romans, Revelation 1.1, 1, 1, 7, 3, 10, 7, 11, 18, 15, 3, 19, 5, 22, 6. That's a few places, huh? This word serve in the Greek says this, or means this, to serve for hire, to render religious services, to worship, to perform sacred services. This is a word used to describe the priests who serve in the temple, performing the religious duties like offering, sacrifice, prayers, and etc. So the Bible teaches, and please listen, that each Christian in heaven is going to serve God forever. So I think that's probably a pretty good idea that we learn to serve God here, don't you? Now, there are some who have a problem with serving God. In other words, they think, it's not important that I serve God. God doesn't care if I serve him or if I don't serve him. It doesn't really matter. But let me say this to you. The secret of maturity as a Christian is realizing that it is the best goal to learn to serve God better. The apostles James and John liked the idea of one day reigning with Christ in his kingdom. How many like that idea? I know I do. I cannot wait until we get to heaven and everything's like God says it's going to be. And I'm looking forward with ruling and reigning and the thousand years with Christ, and I know that's going to happen, and I'm looking forward to being in heaven and ruling and reigning with Christ. Because every Christian will. James and John liked that idea, but they must have understood what it looked like. They had the idea that it was all about ranking, golden chairs, and being in spotlights for eternity. But let me read you what Mark says, chapter 10, verse 42. But Jesus called them to himself. And he said to them, you know that those who consider rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be among you. For whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let me say this to you, and I say this to myself. Being a servant is not the worst thing you can happen to you. It is the best. And to be a servant, guess what? Humility is important. You can't learn what it means to be a servant without learning humility. It is my belief that people do not serve God because of arrogance or pride. This is just my belief. Because they think this, I don't need to serve God. I don't have time to serve God. And here's even another part of arrogance and pride. I'm not equipped to serve God. There's not one of us in this room and there's not one Christian who in their own equipping, their own ability can serve God the way God wants us to serve God calls us to service, but he gives us the ability and gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he's called us to do and to be who he's called us to be. I must say that we have a, a pretty neat body in the sense of there are many in the body who really do serve God. 
young and old. But there are many also who are not doing anything for God's kingdom but their own kingdom. And I put this question to you this morning, how are you serving God? Look at me, because I want you to look at full force of this. Because one day when we get to heaven, you're going to be serving God. And you're going to say this, well, pastor should have taught me, it's his fault. Okay. I'll have enough false blames on me already, but that's okay, add that one too. The thing is, how are you serving God? Well, me and the man upstairs have an understanding about how I serve him. I've heard that said before. And that understanding is only the understanding of you on your side, but it's not the understanding of God. I can't tell you how wonderful it is to serve God. But it costs. It costs. It costs you your life. Let's look at the third one, things we'll do in heaven. We will share with God's people an endless, unbroken fellowship. Look at me. How many have ever had a problem with another Christian brother? Raise your hand. All of us, if you've been a Christian for any time in length, you've had some problem. It doesn't mean that it's been a big problem. It can be a small thing. But the Bible teaches many places that we will have endless fellowship with other Christians. We will have time to get to know each other better. But listen to this part. I think this is awesome. <clears throat> that we are going to get to know people that went before us. Yes, men like Elijah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, all those, and those are wonderful. But there were a lot of great men and women <clears throat> who lived in the bush who lived in Africa, who lived in Vietnam, and all different kinds of places, China, that you've never heard of, that loved God, walked with God, and some of them were killed for their belief. The Bible teaches we'll be able to have fellowship with these people also. But remember also that we'll be reunited with loved ones, family members, and friends who have gone to be with the Lord. I really can't wait to see Sherry's mom and my mom. And I'm looking kind of forward to seeing my dad. Well, I should look more forward to it because he's gonna, he has a brand new nature. But that's what we'll be doing partly in heaven. And verse 4 says, They shall see him face to face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. They shall be no more night there, and they need no lamp, nor light, nor sun, for the Lord God himself will be their light, and they shall reign forever and ever. How many have ever said this, God, just show me you. Just reveal yourself to me in some way or another, God, please, some way or another. The Bible teaches literally that God will see, we will see God face to face. We will see him in this intimacy that we've never experienced in our life ever. Now, you got to remember when we see God in this place, we're going to be perfect inside. God's not going to look at us and say, like he does today, let's work on this, let's change this. Because you're going to be perfect. And you're going to be able to see God like you've never seen him before. I want you to read, listen to this. This is by C.H. Spurgeon, and it, it touched my heart. I wanted to touch yours. After I got done reading this, I said, wow. He says this, by which I understand two things. First, that they shall literally and physically with their risen bodies actually look into the face of Jesus. And secondly, 
that spiritually their mental faculties shall be enlarged so that they shall be enabled to look into the very heart and the soul and the character of Christ so as to understand him, his work, his love, his all in all, and they never, as they never understood him before. Could you imagine that? For the first time, we'll be able to see Christ the way that he desires for us to see him. Listen to what Psalm 17, 15 says. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wake in your likeness. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, For now we see through a glass darkly, then face, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even also as I am known. You know, I, I see God every day through the scripture. I want to learn more about God. I ask God to cleanse me and wash me. Every day I ask God to forgive my sins. I want that intimacy with God. I want that relationship with God. And I have it, and so do you. But I believe that we're only seeing one grain of sand of the relationship that God desires for us. And I believe that all the sands of the earth is what God desires for us in the sense of intimacy. We will see so much more about God. And what a hope that is. It says there, and his name shall be on their foreheads. On every one of us as Christians, we will bear his name. But this has a meaning to it also. When someone's name is put on someone's forehead, it means ownership. Which means that we belong to God and he belongs to us. I have no problem with that. Do you? But there's much more meaning than that. If I belong to somebody, that means that they must do two things for me. They must provide for me and they must protect me. So we all like that, don't we? I belong to God. God has to provide for me. I belong to God. God has to protect me. Nothing can get to me unless it goes to God first. That's what the Bible teaches. And I can't tell you how many times God has saved my life and how God has been faithful in providing for me personally, my family, and for this church. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. But there's also a responsibility that the Bible teaches concerning the one that is owned. The owned must respond to the owner's love by obedience and surrender. So in other words, God's part, he does it without a doubt. But what about my part? If I'm owned by God, God, respond, God just says I must be obedient. That doesn't mean I'm going to be obedient perfectly. It means that my heart wants to obey God in everything that he says that I'm supposed to obey. But let's go a little further than that. Why does God want you to obey? Why does God not want you to do certain things? Because all sin leads to the same place. It leads to death. Sin always has a price. It always does destruction. Always. The devil lies and says, you know what? Sin is good for you. Sin is such a blessing. It makes you so happy. It makes you so wonderful. The person who gets drunk, he gets him up in the morning and he's staggering up. Sometimes he's got black eyes. Sometimes he's got a broken jaw. Sometimes he has all different kinds of things. Oh, that sin was so wonderful. And it helped my relationship with other people. I've just got great friends now. I beat up a few, but I'm okay with that. 
You see, God desired for us to be obedient because there are blessings that come with that obedience and it keeps us away from sin that will destroy our lives. Amen? There's a reason why God says, don't do that. It's going to destroy you. So if I belong to God, then I'm to obey. And there's another part, I'm to surrender. The biggest problem you have is your will. I want to do what I want to do. I want to say what I want to say. I want to go where I want to go. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to. <laughs> and what does God say? Surrender. Many years ago, when I first saw this word, I thought, surrender? What does exactly God mean? And I had a picture in my mind about a guy who has a gun. He pulls out his gun. He walks over to you, and he says, surrender. And what's the first thing you do? Anything you say, buddy. Anything you say. That's surrender. I surrender to you, God. And this is something that God says, yes, my name's on you. You belong to me. I own you. Obey me and surrender. But sometimes the thought is this. American Christianity says, I own God. God doesn't own me. And it's not true. You can't own God. You are owned because you were bought with a price as a Christian. God paid for you through Jesus. Amen? Amen. It says there, there shall be no more night. How many like the nighttime? Please raise your hand. I thought it's not a bad thing to like the night. But there's never going to be night in heaven. No more nightmares. No more scary things. You know, evil goes out at night more. That's how it works. The darkness. And there'll be no more darkness. No more of anything like that. But the light will shine and it'll be Jesus Christ shining and there'll be no sun or moon, so to say. It'll be 24-7 light, always. I like that. And they shall reign forever and ever. Our reign with God will never end. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servant the things that must shortly come to pass. So what John is being told is that, guess what? Guess what? This is going to happen, God says. I promise you this is going to happen. It says here, this must shortly take place. Now the word that it speaks about shortly here literally means a tachometer. We get our tech word tachometer from it. For those who are older, you know what that tachometer is. You put the gas down and the tachometer goes up. That's what it is. And it's literally a, a revving up. In other words, when these things start happening, they're going to move really quickly. Now, what are these things it's talking about? First of all, Israel as a nation. In 1948, for the first time in the history of the world, Israel became a nation. It was the first nation that's ever been, so to say, reborn in the history of the world. That's one of them. Increase of knowledge. Raise your hand if you've seen knowledge increase in the last 10 years. All you have to do is raise your phone. The Mark of the Beast, Ten Nation Confederation, the Antichrist, which will head it up, earthquakes, fires, days of Noah, days of Lot, it's all going to go fast. Are we in those kind of days? You know, I kind of ha was hesitant to share this with you, because when I shared it yesterday, it was kind of like the men went, 
Most of you have probably heard of the Great Reset. And you can find this if you want to go and look on it on weforum.org. On May 21st, they will meet for the second time this year. And they want to start to implement a one world government. On their web page, this is what they say they want to do. First, eliminate national sovereignty and independence. That's of the whole world. Destroy and replace the free enterprise economic system. Eliminate private property. Own nothing and be happy. Abolish Christianity. Move into a cashless society. Make a universal society. They say everyone will be equal and everyone will be severed from the ravishes of competition. As a result, the whole world will be happy and at peace. Now, I want to share with you, there is about 25 men that are leaders in the world today that is part of this group. I only want to mention four or five. The head of this is Klaus Schwab. Involved is Prince Charles, Bill Gates, George Soros, Dr. Fucci, or Fauci, however you want to say his name. This is what we are seeing in our modern day. And this is what the Bible says will happen in the last days, so to say. Now I want to say this, this is not the end, but the beginning of the future God made for us. It's how you look at things that way you will get your hope or you will get your discouragement. Things do not affect me in any way. And let me tell you why. Because my hope is not here on this earth. My hope is in heaven and the future. And God has made a promise that these are the things that were going to happen and that will lead to the future God has promised us. That's how it works. Now, he says in verse 7, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this prophecy. So he says here, blessed is he who keeps these words of this prophecy. This blessing reminds us that prophecy gives us a word to keep. Not merely material for interesting discussion and debates. The main intent of prophecy is to lead us to trust and obey God and apply his truth to the way we live. Prophecy is always given to stir up love and good works. John takes great pain to emphasize that we are responsible to keep the sayings of this book. Now he goes on, verse 8, Now I, John, saw and heard these things. And when I heard and I saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am a fellow servant, and of the brethren, the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, book, worship God. So he literally says, look, I'm just a servant like you. John makes a mistake again. This is the second time it happens that he begins to worship a man. Verse 10, then he said to me, do not seal the words of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He was unjust, let him be unjust. He was filthy, let him be filthy. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. So we see that this book, like Daniel, Daniel's book was sealed up until the end. This book is not. This is the book that God says, I want you to know, I want you to understand, I want you to search in the scripture and you'll find out the truth. I want you to know these things. And behold, verse 12, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his works. 
Let me say this quickly because this is important and then we'll move on and we're almost done. The rewards that Jesus gives here is not talking about salvation. When a person receives Christ, it is a gift from God. It is not something that is earned. That's what rewards are. The Bible teaches that by grace we are saved. Grace is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God. But there are also going to be rewards given, the Bible teaches, for what we have done concerning here on this earth. Now, he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I am the first and I am the last. In other words, we know that's the alphabet. The Alpha is the first letter, and the Omega is the last letter. We know this is true, but what it's really saying is, that what God has started will be complete. It's going to be finished. Verse 14, blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may eat through the gates into the city and enter into the gates of the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexual immorals and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. I want you to notice something important. He calls these people outside, and they're not going to be outside. He's talking about people that are like this, who do these things, who will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he calls them dogs. Let me share with you what the Greek says. It is a man of impure mind. It is an impotent man. In the New Testament, it also refers to legalists. So in other words, those who are legalists. A legalist is someone who does religious things religiously. And if you don't keep them, you are in trouble. You got to keep them like me. Now, that doesn't mean you don't keep God's word. That's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about is not having a relationship with God and being in a religion instead of a relationship. Let's look at a couple of more of these things will be outside. Sorcerers are drug takers, those who take drugs. Whoremongers, fornicators, unlawful sexual uh, relationships, prostitutes, murders is homicide, idolaters is anything, anyone who worships a false god and practices a lie, intentionally brings forth falsehood, Perverse, deceitful precepts. Verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angels to testify to you. These things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star, and the spirit of the bride says, come, and let him who hears come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the waters of life freely. This is an important part, beloved. Is this an invitation to Jesus asking him to return? Or is it an invitation to those who are spiritually thirsty to come to Jesus? Jesus invites all to come. This word thirsty is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. To suffer from thirst, those who are said to thirst painfully feel the want of and eagerly long for those things which have the soul is to be refreshed and support are strengthened. Freely, for nothing, undeservedly. This is an invitation, I believe, for people who do not know God to come to him. There is a thirst that God has put into every person and only God can fill it. And I can say, as a Christian, that when I received Christ, the thirst was gone. Now, I keep myself drinking. I keep on drinking the Holy Spirit. I keep on asking God to fill me every day and to walk in the Spirit. And my life does not thirst anymore in that sense. And I've never said this as a Christian. I can honestly say this after being a Christian 40-some years. Of that, I wonder if I really found the truth. I wonder, you know, something seems to be missing. I maybe, maybe I, none of that has enters my heart or my mind. 
because I know that this river that God gives, I drink from, and I know it's a true river. And that, that is offered to every single person ever born. Now, God in the last few verses begins to warn all of us. Here's a warning. For I testify, verse 18, to everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and the, from the things which are written in this book. What God is saying here is that any man, any woman who adds or subtracts from this book will be plagued and will lose their place in heaven. That's what God is saying, word for word. In other words, this book is not to be messed with, but to be believed and to be practiced. Blessed are those who read and hear and practice the word of this prophecy, putting them into practice in their life. Now listen to what Deuteronomy 4, 2 says. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I have commanded you. In Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6, every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. God's pretty serious about that, isn't he? Pretty heavy warning. And then he ends with these last verses, 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I, am, I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. What an awesome chapter. So how quickly is he coming for you? We don't know, do we? But I do believe that the time of the return of Jesus Christ is very, very near. I do believe that the day of the, uh, the hand of the Lord or the day of the Lord is close. And let me say this to you, and it's probably in the same thing in your heart. My heart yearns for the Lord to come back. As a Christian, you should in no way say, oh my gosh, the Lord's coming back. Oh, I'm just so scared about the Lord coming back. That's foolishness. God's name is written on your forehead and you belong to God if you're a born again Christian. If you're not, you better become a Christian. The Bible teaches it's so simple to become a Christian. You must believe that Jesus came down from heaven, died and arose. You must believe you're a sinner. Ask God to forgive your sins. Ask Christ to come into your heart and live. And the Bible says you become born again. Your name is written in the book of life. But let me go further. That's where life begins. My whole life is different now. My heart is different. Everything changes in me, which will make everything change outside of me. Can a man take fire in his bosom and it not be or affect him? It can't be. You know, I went to watch the movie, and I'll end it here. I went to watch the movie when I first became a Christian. And the movie was, I believe, was called Left Behind. How many watched that movie many years ago? And do you remember how many people were left in the church? Even the pastor was left there. The church was full, and the pastor was still up there preaching. What's my point? My point is, is this. Going to church is wonderful. God wants you in his house. That's where you learn about God. That's where you can get born again and become saved. That's where you begin to mature. That's where you become part of the body of Christ and you, you do certain things, being part of that body. You function and you grow. You get blessed and you get took, taken care of and watched over. A lot of things happen in the body. You need the church without a doubt. And like Pastor Ken said this morning, 
We are the church. You and I are the church. But that doesn't make you born again. When a person becomes born again, they know it without a doubt they've been born again. Without a doubt. I can tell you the hour, the second, and I, I can play it back in my mind right now when I accepted Christ and I became born again. And it changed me. Ask my wife if you don't believe it. Completely changed me. And it continues to change me. And this is where the question comes in. If it doesn't change me and my life is not changed and I have to ask myself, am I playing church or am I really a born again believer? As for you as a Christian, we must watch. We must be ready. And we must pray. Let's bow our hearts this morning. Father, we are grateful for the word of God. And Father, in your word you say you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind, Lord God. And Father, we want to thank you for that. The word of God, as for us, the church, the body of Christ, your children, are to never bring fear. But Father, that to encourage us, strengthen us, Remove ignorance and bring in truth, Lord God. So we thank you for that this morning, Lord God. And Father, the things we've learned today are things, God, that you have provided for us concerning the future. Father, we don't feel the future because we know who holds the future, and that's you. But Lord, we ask this morning that you would prepare us, Father, for what you have for us in the future, God. We pray for any soul in here this morning who does not know you, God. But Father, this morning, you offer yourself this morning. May they call upon the name of the Lord, just like your word says, God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Lord God. And your spirit will come in them and live in them, Lord God. And they shall be your people. So Father, if there's any who have not accepted you, Lord, you will not reject them. So may they call upon you and receive you this morning, God. And thank you for the hope you've given us, Lord, and the future, Lord. The future is out of this world and we're looking forward to it, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray, Father. Amen. This morning we have the...